Welcome to Poker Hands Dissected, episode number two. For those of you who are new, this is where we're basically dissecting hands and really dissecting the thought process of a player. So everybody has their own way of approach, own style of approach. Instead of advocating like, listen, this is the right line you should take. You need to do this. You need to do that. We look at it from the perspective of the player. So trying to understand how they're approaching the game and criticizing that thought process as opposed to the actions. I think there's a problem with a lot of coaching and a lot of hand analysis where everybody just kind of contributes, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. And sometimes there are things where you're really wrong and sometimes there are things where you're really right. But the reality is in order to really understand that middle ground, you need information. And most players comment on hands without having enough information to actually make con commentary or intelligent commentary. So they don't really uh, absorb as much context. And that's what we're trying to do here. So we're going to be reading this hand from the perspective of the player and breaking down their action. So let's get started. So King Jack on the button, player raises to 15 and we call. So the student's why is villain has been pretty loose, loose passive at this table over the last two hours. I had not seen him get out of line at all. I felt like King Jack Suda was a good hand to play in position against the hijack's opening range. Okay, so a couple of things to say about this lovely statement. First, you know, I never understand what people's definition of pretty loose passive is. Uh, I don't know. You, you sitting here and watching this might think that loose passive means, you know, playing 30% of hands and very rarely three betting or four bet. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's not really operationally defined. So I always get worried when I read people's descriptions because... I'm making, I'm basing most of their logic about ranges off of their description. So if you tell me, Blake, this guy is a super nit and he barely plays, but the guy played 10 out of like 30 hands and you're way off in your perception, my advice stacks on that range or stacks on that perception. So the problem is I start giving you advice that's not necessarily correct because we're not thinking about we're not on the same page when it comes to what a player's range actually is. I just wanted to call that out. Make sure you really you know, have definitions for what you're, it's not online poker, online poker, you put, pull it up, you know, VPIP 20, PFR 20, and everybody knows what that is over a large sample size or whatever. A live, it's, it, I tend to believe that live players get lost in the language and they don't really know how to operationally define things. I'm just calling that out right now. So he had not seen him get out of line. Again, I don't really know what that means. And this is interesting. I felt that I felt like King Jack suited was a good hand to play in position against the hijack's opening range. So a, a couple things to say about this logic. First, you're saying that our player is saying here that their opponent is, you know, loose passive and that King Jack suited is good to call on the button against this loose passive player's range. King Jack suited. It's one of those things where King Jack suited is obviously a decent hand to play in position. Uh, however, that being said, the hijack raises to $15, which at a 1-2 game, I know they're fairly deep, but at a 1-2 game, his sizing could be a little bit more than we actually, it could be a little bit more than average right now. So this is one of those spots where, yeah, your opponent might be loose passive, but his his sizing and the fact that he raised might mean that he's probably got a better hand than you're giving him credit for. I just don't know. Maybe the dynamic is every raise preflop is 15. But if you say someone's loose passive and then all of a sudden they raise to 15, I don't know why you think King Jack may be a good hand to play against that range because it's it's very possible that the hands that this player actually raises to 15 with is most of the time crushing King Jack, but oh, I don't know. I don't know really there, but I think that there's some inconsistencies here with this player's logic. So it's something I want to, I want you to pay attention to. And, and really when we're dissecting a player's why we're not looking for this, I don't care about this specific hand. Like I really don't quite frankly give a shit about the fact that he has King Jack. I, I care about his thought process and the flaws in those thought process that are going to extend to every time he sits down at the table. And sometimes it is like I give a player a definition of loose passive. They do an action that suggests that they're probably not, not it's out of character for a loose passive player. And then all of a sudden, I assume that this play, my hands crush. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, let's continue. We call folds around. Flop 653. Our opponent bets 20 and we call. 
Now here he says, I decided to call because I thought this was a flop that did not connect strongly with villain's range. Felt maybe I could take pot away on turn. So, all right. So, I mean, that's fair. I, I do agree that it, for the most part, when this guy bets on this board, that he's likely to not have connected. But now he creates this plan for taking away, taking the pot away on the turn. Now this is, I always find this interesting, guys. When When players like, they make these plans, like they think, they think along multiple streets, but they don't usually like honor what they're going to do along multiple streets. So they'll be like, all right, listen, I think it's wise to call here. I could probably take it away from the turn, but they don't have any more logic behind that. So it's like, listen, I think that I could take it away from this player on the turn if certain cards come or if there's certain runouts or if there's another diamond or if there's some sort of event. Just saying I'm going to take that, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to float and, and crush them post file. It doesn't really work. You need to have some sort of plan where the story fits into what you're trying to do or else you end up just getting lost. So if you're going to make those plays post flop, you need to be good at thinking you need to think. You need to be able to actually see what cards could come that you could potentially represent, how you're going to convince this player to fold, if you're going to take those deals. I, I have a feeling that this is not going to go that well. But anyways, the $20 bet he calls. Turns a seven. All right, so his opponent checks, and then he checks and states that I now have a flush draw. And I want to see the river card for free, so I check. And the problem with this is I feel like this player is trying to do two different things at once. You know, in the beginning, he's like, oh, you know, my range plays well against this player. And then he's like, oh, on the turn, I can potentially attack him. And now he's like, all right, I want to check to see a free river. Like, it's one of these moments where you're either trying to push your player off a hand or you're trying to get value and because he's not actually thinking about what his opponent has he doesn't know what to do so he's kind of alternating in between two things and i'm not saying that in poker you're not going to start a hand off and then all of a sudden there's a, there's not going to be an adjustment where it's like all right i have a decent hand but i'm going to turn this into a bluff like those pivots and those switches happen but i don't think this player is actually planning along multiple streets meaning i kind of think that they're full of shit in their ability to say like listen i'm calling here because later on and we see this with a lot of players especially that like learn from some players online where they have like part of the thought process but not the full thought process so they make statements like you know king jack really flops well against this player's range but they're not really thinking about the player's range or they'll make a hand they'll they'll make statements like you know uh, seven nine flops really well in multi-way pots and it does but in, if you don't have the ability to actually extract value and think along multiple streets it doesn't really play that well because you can't play it that well. And I think this player has part of that. I just I just don't see a compelling reason for not betting right now, especially based on his previous actions. It just makes a lot more sense to bet based on what he was saying. So I don't understand why he would actually check there. So it makes me believe that there's just this drop off in thought. And we see that a lot. Like players these days are really competent pre-flop and they, you know, they understand ranges. And then all of a sudden, like after the flop and the turn, they just stop thinking about their opponent's range and it, it leads to problems. You don't really know where you're at. You don't know what to do. And that's kind of what's happening here. Um, but let's see. Let's see what else he does. So checks back, river to 10 of clubs, opponent bets pot or a little bit over pot. He calls and we see him win with King Jack and his opponent's got ace queen. So his logic is, I feel like I played this hand pretty well. I was a bit confused by the river bet size my opponent made. Obviously I was not folding with the second nuts though. All right, so first of all, I mean, we could, we could kind of go down the rabbit hole of these statements, but he didn't play the hand pretty well, and, and we need to define what pretty well really is. So you're, when you play a hand well, you have an objective and you accomplish that objective. So for example, if you believe to have the best hand or you believe to be way ahead of your opponent's range and your goal is to get all of your opponent's chips in the middle and you accomplish that by maybe doing something different or doing something out of the norm and you can make the argument that the line that you took over time is going to work, you played the hand well, remember? So playing the hand well is not always driven just by you won the hand. So a lot of players will think that. They win a hand and they're like, oh, I played it well. Well, not necessarily. You could have done everything wrong, still won, doesn't mean you play well. It just meant you got it right in that specific hand. So it's important to separate that. I do not think this opponent understands that and it's they need to get it. Second thing I want to call out, he says, I was a bit confused by the river bet size my opponent made. Now, the reason why this player is confused is because this player is not actively thinking about what his opponent actually has. So understand that, you know, if you don't really 
narrow a range actively. And narrow a range is a term that is used overused in poker so much now. Everybody always says that they're narrowing a range or I was thinking about my opponent's range or I'm playing against this range. But the reality is very few players, I feel like, do it. <laughs> they, they they say it, they understand the concept, but when they're actually sitting down and playing poker, they're not saying, okay, what kind of hands would check in this spot and then all of a sudden bet on the river, bet pot on the river? Like, what would he be doing this with? Ace queen, ace king, could he do it with the sec? Could he do it with that? There's none of that thought process at here at all. Which makes me believe a couple things. So first, this player's prefop logic of him playing King Jack well in position is probably wrong. I don't even know if playing King Jack, even this team, is profitable for this player right now. I think that I would probably have told him to like raise or fold because I just don't think that he's going to be able to make money if he has this level of thinking over time. That's like the, the first thing there. And, and the, the second thing that we really need to call out or get this player to do is to make sure that they continue the level of thought from pre-flop to post-flop. And this is something that we see in a lot of players. Like, you know, they understand pre-flop ranges. They understand that somebody might be loose aggressive or loose passive or t whatever. But then all of a sudden, post-flop, they just stop thinking. And it's, it, maybe they have the capacity to do it, but they don't actually do it. And it's still why, like, I really feel that today's poker player needs to get more turn and river experience. I just, I just feel like a lot of players don't have experience where all of a sudden, you know, five or six minutes into the hand, all of these events happen and they have to replay those events and say to themselves, okay, like what is going on here? And they don't really know if they're making a thin call. They just don't know where they're at because it's it's not active. It's let me think about the flop. Let me think about pre-flop. Let me think about the flop. And then kind of just like auto call or bet mode, depending on what the board is. And it's not really playing like higher level poker. Like playing higher level poker is taking into consideration what your opponent might be doing based on that flop. And I just think that uh, pre-flop ranges or understanding a player's range pre-flop is just so much easier than thinking about what a player is likely to do post-flop just because it's just more binary and it's just more standard and it's trickier later on. And, and this player doesn't do it and that's a big flaw in their game. And yeah, I definitely, I don't think that like calling was bad in this spot. Obviously, uh, you could call, but I think there's, he could have got way more, way more value over time. And listen, his card hit, okay? So the reality here is when that bricks and his opponent bets, he's probably going to say, I have to fold. So most of the time, this player is definitely going to lose money in this hand the way that they played it. They just happened to get lucky on the on the river. And when they got lucky, they didn't even get max value. They didn't even get more value. I think he could have made more money if he probably would have bet the turn and his opponent would have taken one more stab on it on the river. He would have made more money. I mean, the opponent's going to fold to a shove probably, but you know that's a considerable more amount of money if he would have just bet the turn. And he didn't do that. So there's a lot of flaws in here. I hope you see them for yourself. I hope you see where you make these mistakes. Um the goal of these assignments are not to really, or these breakdowns are not to overly criticize lines. And maybe I'll do that later on. I'm trying to point out flawed logic. If you want to submit a hand, make sure you go to schoolcards.com, click on menu on the right side and click submit a poker hand. You'll go through this process where we get your whys out of each hand and I'll break it down for you. Make sure you head, sign up to schoolcards.com slash value, sign up for our value list. We're sending out one poker hand dissected that we don't release on YouTube. And, uh, that's about it. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you subscribe. We are releasing between two to three videos every single week. Also, make sure you head over to schoolofcards.com slash value. The link's below in the description. It's basically our value email list where I, I do random webinars for free once or twice a month. I also answer questions, submit hands. We release videos that we don't always release on YouTube. So make sure you check out schoolofcards.com slash value. Enter your name and email and I'll keep you up to date.